This Sunday is September the 11th. Fifteen years ago, the United States surely lived its worst tragedy of its history. And I know, I know you all aware of this unless you hid in the cave during the last few years. It's everywhere these days in the media. The networks are asking people on the street, where were you when the Twin Tower fell? And all sorts of journalists are trying to explain how the world has changed since that day. But despite the extensive coverage the topic received lately, one very crucial question remains under the radar. How have we changed during the last 15 years? I don't know if you remember, shortly after the attacks, <coughs> sorry, shortly after the attacks, President George W. Bush made a public appearance at Washington's largest Islamic uh, center and acknowledge the incredible, valuable con contribution that millions of American Muslims have made to their country and call for them to be treated with respect. New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, on the 11th itself, went on television, not only to uh, urge calm, but to remind New Yorkers not to take their griefs on Muslim. And a few days later, he held an interfaith uh, prayer service at Yankee, Yankee Stadium that brought Islamic clerics with Christian and Jews. Oh, of course, there were some stupid individuals who attack everyone slightly looking different or foreign. But overall, most understood that these terrorist attacks had little to do with the Muslim faith. People were told that the Quran says in chapter 5, verses 53, who kills a soul, unless it for murder or wrecking corruption in a land, it shall be as if had killed all humankind. And he who save a life, it shall be as he has given life to all humankind. Well, unfortunately, much happened during the last 15 years. We went through uh, the most important recession uh, since 1929 that hit mostly the white middle class. Every week, popular TV series like 24 and CIS and Homeland we have character that are investigating, arresting, or, or stopping Muslims before they kill innocent citizens, innocent Americans. And because of a few terrorist attacks or very few close call, we now have to show up at the airport at least three hours in advance to go through all the security checks. Our parliament have been turned into a fortress and governments are spying on our phone and our communication without our con consent. We have seen the emergence of a new political class who use fear as an edge. They take rhetorics and ideas from the margin and they bring them in the mainstream by giving their supporters a megaphone or a, a, a box of matches. And maybe the worst part of it is that we let them do it, that we sometimes even have elected them. Lately, some of these men or women, both in Canada and the U.S., have asked for extreme vetting of immigrants to select only those who are who are believing in our values, like hard work and equality between men and women, as if, no, as if it was the case of everyone living in this land. <laughs> and in France, in France, we still can witness the kerfuffle around the burkini 
and the debate about the amount of fabric of the, the amount of fabric Muslim women, not men, Muslim women, the amount of fabric they should wear when they are at the beach. At the end of the Cold War, if we have been told we were entering a new world order in which there will be no more uh, major divisions or conflicts, well, with the event of 9-11, 15 years ago, we cannot say that we change much. We just return to our old practice and beliefs. We return to a binary understanding of the world, the good old us versus them. You are with us or you're against us. If you want to adopt our values, our traditions, our religion, well, you're a good guy. You can belong to us. But if you don't, it means that you are one of them. No, we return to our suspicion, fear of everyone who is different. We return to our xenophobia. You see, one of the main reasons people voted yes for the Brexit was immigration. And let's be honest here, it was not because it, there were too many French or Spaniards in England. No, immigrant, Muslims, strangers are now part of some kind of a, a blur of suspicious individual. And organized religion also took a beating during the last 15 years. For many, that it has become a synonym of violence, war, division, and the opposite of science and modernity. Because of a few, not case, more than four billion people associated with the major religion of our world are often labeled as back, backward or, or outdated. And honestly, we did not, much, did not help much to change this perception. Of course, there were a fair number of initiatives here and there to bring people together so that we may know each other better. Uh, we're delighted when our magazine, like United Church Observer, write on the front page about a mosque in Toronto that welcomed pe uh, people from the LGBTQ community. We like to study among ourselves the multiple paths leading to the same God. And yet, and yet because sometimes, often I would say, we're so obsessed about our survival of our institution and our congregations, the accuracy of the theology of our clergy, the, the place we have lost in the public life or the secularization of our society, we haven't offered a real alternative to the main narrative about religion. Our best answer is often, well, we're not like them. In the first letter to Timothy, well, I have to come back to the Bible because I'm delivering a sermon after all. In the first letter to Timothy, we can read the story of a religious man whose past is marked by violence and persecution. And the author of this biblical text writes in the voice of the Apostle Paul a fairly common practice in the ancient world. He or she presents Paul's faith journey in the form of a testimony. Oh, I know in mainline Protestant and Catholic churches, we tend to get a little uncomfortable when people start testifying to God, what God has done in their lives. We, we don't like this, we don't do that, we're not like them, we sometimes say. No, what we prefer is a good intellectual and theological lecture. Even if study shows us that younger people like Generation X or the Millennials responds better to personal and authentic stories about how God is present and active in someone's life. From 
what we can find in the books of the Acts of the Apostle, in the multiple letters we, in our Bibles, Paul traveled the Mediterranean world to plant new church. And we read also the story of the transform, his transformative experience on the road to Damascus. And we're also aware of his past even if it tends to make us uncomfortable, even if sometimes we wish we could skip over it. Paul persecuted with zeal the first disciple of Jesus. He used violence against those who profess a different creed. He was a perfect example of what we accuse religion these days. And yet, this is the man God chose him, and we should not be surprised about this. Paul saw what it means to create division among the population. He witnessed firsthand how the fabric of a community can be broken by intolerance and fear. So one day, Paul changed. He said, Enough of this nonsense, enough of this violence, enough of this bigotry. So he traveled the Roman Empire, he met all sorts of people with various culture and different origins. He came and he came to the conclusion that there should be no more us against them. There should be no longer Jews or Greek slave or free male or female for we are all one in Christ. We are all together in this journey we call life on this planet. Paul's radical exclusion was transformed into radical inclusion in good times, in challenging times. Regardless, love, grace, mercy should be offered to all without exception. We live in a frantic post-9-11 world, and since these events, we have changed, and at the same time, we remain the same. We might have opened our doors and our borders to some refugees and immigrants, but our society remains afraid of all of those who are different than us. And for this reason, it is essential for religious people like us to challenge the language around us. We need to wake up. We need to get out of our defensive mode and we need to share how God's mercy and love makes a difference in our lives. And we should not be afraid, not afraid to testify about our stories because and maybe I'm biased here, but I'm firmly convinced that our message is as good and maybe a little more inclusive than what we have heard during the last 15 years. So thanks be to God and amen.